And I found that there was an organization called the Jewish Relief Unit that was training people to go to um, Germany or elsewhere uh, immediately after the war. And I joined. By the time I, got, I went to Germany, I was appointed to work with the director of the, um, of the whole unit, um, Henry Lanza. And I first went to the headquarters to work with him. Um, and we frequently were, went, to, went to Belsen. And I was taken by a driver to Belsen. And there was already a small team of people under the um, auspices of um, uh, Mrs. Henriquez, the, uh, the wife of Basil Henriquez. And where people were already working there. Um, and Camp One had been burnt down. Um, I suppose the thing I remembered most when I first looked at Camp One was the smell. And it was the smell, and I've never forgotten it, it was the smell of um, geraniums, like that sweet, dank smell of geraniums, and the mounds of the, the, gra the mass graves, the burials, and the fact that people were then incarcerated in the former SS barracks. And I spent time talking to people, the survivors, in those dark, cold, you know, barracks. You know, when you first listen to the stories that survivors tell you, uh, you are, you, you feel overwhelmed with the enormity of what they're telling you. Mainly the losses, the losses of so many people. If my husband had done that and if he had only listened to me, he wouldn't have been killed. The kind of if quality. You know, that most of the stories were around the if, if only I'd, you know, when nothing could have saved them, but nothing could have saved them. And you listened to this knowing it. And you felt so helpless. And then I began to feel um, that I had to make closer contact with them. And I sometimes would hold on to people, would sit on the floor, and people would hold on to you, and they could, they, they, they dug their fingers into your arms, and, they, and I found that rocking, as children who are very deprived and unhappy rock, rocking became a kind of mode that we adopted. And we would rock, and they would tell their stories, and I say that it was like a kind of vomit. They would, would come out like a vomit, you know, this, the stories, and some were terrible story of how one woman lost an eye when she was being whipped and how the women had to stand around and watch this. Like that, that kind of story that you heard time and time again. But I began to realize something and I began to, to get a sense of, of agency. I, I felt that, okay, I am listening to this and they are wanting me to listen. So perhaps my role is to be their witness and to say to them that that's my role. To say to them the truth, I can't bring those people back. But I can listen and I can be your witness and I will be your witness. And I think to those people who were going to die, and there were people who were going to die, and I knew that, I think it was incredibly important and I've never you know, people say to me, why is it so important that, that people's story must be told? But it is, it's absolutely vital that their story is told and that they know that their story is going to be told. I do remember the transport to Belson, which was not one of those cattle trucks as one sees, because all um, trains were, were co-opted for use for these transports which were being done by the tens of thousands and in fact I apparently travelled on a, a normal train and we went 
into Belsen and um, my father was separated from us and I was with my mother. And we came there and they, they put us into barracks, into a camp. And what was the camp? The camp, the barracks. In the barracks, uh, each barrack was more than a hundred people. And the barracks had only beds, three tier beds. That's what the barracks consisted of. Three tier beds, one on top of the other, and this, some straw on the beds and a thin blanket. And men were separate and women were separate. And you went to, you know, you, you arrived in the camp, you went into a barrack, as many people as possible, then comes the next barrack. And that's how they placed us in the barracks. And they slept one on top of you know, the three tier. Uh, having suffered from uh, asthma a bit, and the sheer thought of having somebody so close to me uh, on the middle bunk or bottom bunk, I just couldn't face it. My mother made every effort that we would get. Not that it made much difference because the roof of the barrack was so close on top of us, but for me, not having a person above us made me feel that it was safer. It was very cold. It was very uncomfortable and bleak. The food was uh, transpired then was very poor and everything was, seemed to be made of turnips. There was turnip soup, and there was turnip jam, and there was turnip coffee, and, um, and, and very little of it. And bread, no doubt, also had turnips in it. We had a ration every day, um, and there were sort of churns which came with some sort of soup, which had practically nothing in it. Um, uh, of, of any uh, food value um, and, uh, and, and was very little of it. I mean, that, that is when we started to experience hunger and cold. I certainly remember the food, uh, what there was of it. It was dreadful. Um, there was water, a turnip boiled in water, and that was known as a soup, and this one piece of turnip and a piece of black bread very hard, and uh, that was the day's ration. My parents gave me theirs. Uh, it wasn't enough to keep body and soul together, but I took theirs because I was hungry and I didn't know any different. And they starved to death. Um, my mother in December no, sorry, my father in December, 44, and my mother in January, 45. I used to faint every day from hunger. I was a child growing up, and her parents couldn't think about it. And, and still my father tried to keep kosher as much she, as he could. And then he asked the rabbi what to do, because I kept fainting daily. So the rabbi said he should give me to it whatever he can put his hands on. He shouldn't see kosher, and I should give it to me too. The soup was brought in in such churns like they bring milk today. So the men took turns to go to the kitchen to fetch those big churns. And then one opportunity was when you went to the kitchen that you could steal something. My father's turn came as well, he went. And my father brought back an onion. Now, uh, we peeled that onion and we sat down to eat it. We felt that onion in every part of our body. The onion is such a strong, healthy food that our fingertips become, began tingling. But for, since then, for me, an onion is a very important food. You were with you your mother? I was with my mother with in another And set. did you see him? You... Not every day. Sometimes, and it was difficult at times, uh, because also they organized strange things that we had either to stand on roll call for hours and hours on end, or that my father was allowed, because he was very, very ill, that he was allowed to stay on his bunk, or I. And then my mother was allowed then to come back, uh, back to me. But it, these were horrible conditions. And nothing to do. I mean, he stood for hours and hours on end 
on Roko. You and remember that? Yeah, that I do remember. And then they would just, you know, laugh their heads off saying somebody was missing, starting all over again, and they knew that nobody was missing. It was just a matter of keeping us standing there. There was one man in there, a Mr. Birnbaum, who um, was, had been a teacher in Berlin. He was in Belsen with uh, his wife and his six children. And um, as the war was progressing, and in fact reaching its end, and people were dying left, right and centre, he gathered orphans as they became orphans. And my father, realising that he wasn't going to survive, went to see this Mr. Birnbaum and asked him to look after me and after the war to get me to his sister-in-law, my aunt in London. And he went to the authorities in the camp and said that he would like to start a school. school. Um, and they mockingly said, yeah, sure, you do that. Um, you can have your school in the room at the end of that barracks there, but you have to clear it first. He didn't know what that meant. Um, so he went to look and he saw that that's where corpses had been stored, piled high, because uh, they couldn't be buried quickly enough. And so they were just put in there until burial could be organized. Uh, so he organized a work party amongst the inmates and they cleared that room and we 50 children had our schoolroom in there. And I remember that he taught us, he'd been a teacher of religious instruction in Germany, in Berlin, and he taught us Jewish studies. And later on, my mother got weaker and weaker, and then she was put on duty sweeping and cleaning inside the camp compound. And Eva and myself were left inside the camp to do basically nothing. One wasn't allowed to gather together. Um, we did a bit of, sort of helping with people who had small children, and we helped a little bit. And I know I went to the back of the camp, I had a spoon, and went with a spoon to scrape out the churns, what little there was left at the wire of the camp. You see, that's when I sort of remember, it must have been there that I suddenly looked back at the camp and there was nothing there. It was all empty. Well, it couldn't really have been empty, but probably at some moments it was, and that sort of stuck in my mind. Um, and Eva, who always loved drawing and eventually became an artist and an art teacher, um, uh, had taken with her a little sketchbook and one of these tiny paint boxes and she must have had some color pencils. This was gold dust. To have a pencil at all was absolute gold dust. You know, children nowadays, they chuck about their biros. Thank goodness, that's lovely, they're cheap and plentiful. But to have a pencil and a piece of paper was, was really something. And she drew pictures. Um, I wish I had it here to show you. Um, a main, occasionally camp scenes, barracks with bunk beds and so on, but mainly um, very, very colorful fairy stories. You know, Snow White and the dwarfs and, 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 and Red Riding Hood and so on, very brightly colored, which of course took her away from where she was. I remember being told by Mrs. Bilnbaum that my mother had died. It was a common occurrence in the camp. And um, she said, "Jetzt musste sehr stark sein, gutes Kind. You have to be very strong and brave." And um, so I took that to heart, but I don't think I understood what she what she said to me because I went back to look in the window to see where she was. I do remember that. Perhaps again, my mother must have tried and said more and more, you know, tomorrow will be better or whatever, just to try and make me worry less. Or she had would give me her crust of bread. Or it's, you know, I find it even difficult now to think how people, how parents managed, yeah. what they did, how they spoke to their children. 
I think as a child, I very much took each day as it came. And we, I certainly had no idea, you know, one, one didn't as a child really think of how this might end. I think our most, most of my sort of concentration was focused on hunger and cold and fear, I suppose, those three things. And, um, and you c concentrated on those things rather on th what might happen tomorrow. Um, I can't remember thinking how will this end or what will we do. I didn't think ahead, which perhaps is as well. <laughs>